All right, great. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining. Uh, my name is Lynn Wells. I'm the Provost and Vice President of Academic at Rock University, but also a board member for eCampus Ontario, and it is my great pleasure to be your moderator today. We have just a, a few housekeeping items uh, that you'll see on the screen for the captions are enabled. We would love it if everyone would introduce themselves in the chat. Um, feel free to drop questions in the question and answer box at any time uh, during the webinar. Uh, Maha, Maha has said she is very open to responding to things in real time, so please feel free. And of course, we are recording this webinar move on now to our land acknowledgement. Um, we'll acknowledge that the land on which the offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And uh, with that, I am very happy uh, to introduce our wonderful speaker, whom I have the pleasure of meeting this morning. Uh, Maha Bali is a professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. Uh, she writes and speaks uh, frequently and very well about social justice, critical pedagogy, and open and online education. She is an avid and very interesting blogger and, of course, has many, many publications and many presentations. Uh, but she is going to tell you more about herself uh, as uh, we go through the presentation. So with that, I will turn over to you, Mama. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you all for, for having me today. I always start my sessions with Assalamu Alaikum because it works for a day and night. And so it's it's 7 p.m. here, but I know it's, it's probably earlier if most of you are in, uh, in North America. Uh, and I always uh, like to ask how you're feeling today. And so some people have already started answering that. I'd love to hear... Thank you, everyone. How everyone else is feeling if you just joined up. I'll pause while some people say that. And you can, if you feel free to also say something about where you are or what you do. Feeling good, warm weather, feeling great. Reading week, not teaching this week. That's interesting. I was I was doing a session in the UK this morning, and they also had reading week, which is not something. in I'm in an American university, and we don't. I have no idea what that means, but I think it means exams or something for you guys. <laughs> so I, we don't have that here. Not not time for exams yet. Exams are like just before Christmas. All right, feeling wonderful. Oh, it's like spring break. Okay, we don't have a fall break. We only have a spring break. Thanks. That helps, Ashley. Great on a rainy day. Fall colors, yeah. Oh, wow. City manager for youth for social. That's amazing. Okay. Okay, I'll get us started. I put the link to my slides in the chat. And um, also, I think Lutvia put uh the one the english and the french link so hopefully everyone has what is useful to them and hopefully all the images have alternative text on them those slides are open for commenting so beyond the moment today if you want to go back and ask me something you can go back to these slides and the slides are with a creative commons license non-commercial so feel free to use them reuse them adapt them as long as you attribute to me and you don't sell them that's fine <laughs> so today i'm going to be talking about aspiring towards socially just care in education. And the session is gonna be interactive, so please stay active in the chat. I can see already people are pretty comfortable doing that. So uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, I'm not in Canada to get to do a land acknowledgement for you, but this is what I usually do in my online presentations, which is we're gonna talk about social justice, then we'll talk about coloniality. And to remember that coloniality survives colonialism that is maintained alive in books and the criteria for academic performance and cultural patterns and common sense, in the self-image of people, in aspirations of self and so many other aspects of our modern experience. And in a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time and every day, and we need to be very cognizant of the ways it's impacting the way we handle ourselves every day and every moment of it. That's again, the short link for my slides, which is in the chat. 
And kind of what to expect today, other than interaction, is we're going to check in, which we just did, and do a chatterfall where I ask a couple of questions and you all answer hopefully in the chat. And I'll share with you some models that um, I've co-developed with others that influence the way I think about um, you know, equity and care and inclusion. Um, and then I'm going to give you a choice of whether you want to see how to apply these to doing online community building activities or how to apply this thinking to how we deal with uh, the advent of, you know, generative artificial intelligence. So it will be your choice towards the end. And so the chatterfall starts with, what nourishes you lately? Someone mentioned mental health and the need for this uh, reading week for that. So tell me, what, what do you do? What nourishes you lately? Ah, K-dramas, Korean dramas, your kids, hiking in the fall forest, sleep. I wish I could sleep. That would be nice. Nature, enjoying outside fall activities, reading, cat, esports, scheduling breaks, walks down along the canal. Oh, that sounds nice, Lynn. Good food in nature, new love. Oh, new love. Nice. <laughs> That's been too long for me. Uh, enjoying outside fall activities. Okay, lots. Laughter, jigsaw puzzles, fresh air and sunshine. Big time for me too. Long drives, check it high. Uh, food, time with family, exercise, coffee, new puppy. Oh, puppies always. Prayer, deep reflective pedagogical learning and thinking. Yeah, that does it for me too, Stephanie. Thanks for mentioning. Decorating, coffee. Yeah, for coffee lovers. Giving back, definitely. Definitely, I don't think it's Desiree or Desire. Um, reading and food. Tea parties, nice. Being outside with the kids, yeah. Playing with the kids like your kid yourself, I think helps too. Listening to audiobooks, I love audiobooks. Time with people I love, definitely big time. I schedule in time with people I love. Make sure that I get enough of that. Music for me too, dogs all the time. Yeah, I don't have a dog, but anybody's dog will do for me. <laughs> Hiking, yes, listening to podcasts. But I'm sure if it was my dog, it would be different. I just love dogs. Family time. All right, thank you all for sharing that. So I really love this quote by Ruha Benjamin. And I think it's relevant to thinking about ecosystem of, of equity and care. Growing the world we want is like the slow tending of a garden. So we need to think about how do we transform plants by fostering relationships, trust, skills, community accountability, and healing. And all of that means we need to cultivate new habits internally and seeding restorative ways of being together interpersonally and uprooting practices of inequality institutionally and then planting alternative possibilities structurally. So there's the internal work, there's the relational work, and then there's the uprooting of everything in the systems that gets in our way and thinking of, okay, let's start something new and do it at the structural level. And so the problem is I think a lot of times we work either on our internal work and we ignore the fires burning outside and then we get consumed or we only work on putting out the blaze outside and we ourselves burn out. Uh, and I think depending on where you are in your institution and what's going on exactly, one of these is probably happening because a lot of times we're not doing both at the same time. And so I wanna acknowledge that a lot of us are dealing with fires outside our control that have been burning us out recently. So let me know if there's a fire outside your control that you're willing to share. What would that be? What's a fire outside your control that's burning? Lingering noise about COVID, yeah. other people's actions a lot of times. Yeah. Worrying about aging parents. Oh, Monica, I hear you. Totally. Totally. That's a very difficult one, especially when you have younger kids and you have to be doing both at the same time and working. Some aspects of being a full-time working mom. A lot of aspects of being a full-time working mom, Haley, I agree. Conflicting priorities at work. World collapsing in front of us. Yeah, you know, definitely that. State of global politics. I think a lot of us are affected. Election in Congo, worrying about a loved one struggling with their mental health. Yeah, that's a very difficult one as well. Everything happening in the Middle East, I agree. Aging parents, other people have that one as well. Yeah, all of those. I don't know what Markham Transit bus is. That must be like a local thing. <laughs> 
Are they striking or something? If if this was France, I'd say they're striking, but this is Canada, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody else likes mental health of loved ones, death of the family. I'm so sorry for your loss, gentlemen. Taking on financial responsibilities at a young age, that's really hard. Okay, I'm sorry that you have to do it. Okay, what about this question? How or where have you grown recently? In what area of your life have you grown recently? Career and education. Every area of life, discipline, organization. That's great, Christina. All over your body, and I wish it would stop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, this is funny. Um, Anna, defining my sphere of influence. Nice. Uh, learning just graduated with MED. Congratulations. I have an MED as well before my PhD. Matthew, self awareness. Ashlyn, finding your voice. Education. Thinking and learning alongside elders. Very nice. <laughs> Being included in a publication for our first time. Congratulations. Awesome. About universal design and learning. Uh, settling into a new city and country. Oh, where are you now, Shekin? Tell me later. Uh, Charlotte, learning a lot for your relationships, language, yeah. learning to accept what's beyond my control and focus. And yeah, and focusing on what you can control and influence. That's a huge turning point, right? Saying no, Janice. I'm still not very good at saying no. I did have to say no to going to Canada for the test conference, but only because I couldn't get the pizza in time, but I'm here now instead. So it wasn't really a no. <laughs> Successfully relocating to Canada. That's yeah, probably a big shift. Appreciation for everything around you daily. Yes, gratitude makes a huge difference. Growing and thriving skills like communication, problem solving, setting boundaries, Keely, really important one. Yeah. Okay, Shaka, we'll check off one. So the first model I want to share with you guys is uh, I'm calling it the Rumi cheese analogy. So I don't know if anyone knows what Rumi cheese is. Does anyone in the audience know what Rumi cheese is? It's an Egyptian cheese. Rumi actually means Roman. <laughs> so it's supposed to be like an, a foreign cheese, but it only exists in Egypt. So I'm not really sure which foreign country they got it from. Um, it's a very uh, salty cheese. It looks like Swiss cheese a little bit, but it's salty. Anyway, it's a model that is actually mimicking another model. Uh, so the original model is actually a Swiss cheese model for respiratory pandemic type defense. So what it is, is because Swiss cheese has holes in it, um, if you try to pass something through the holes, if you have several, it'll pass through eventually because there are holes. But if you have lots of layers, the layers have holes in different places. So you need to have several layers in order to prevent a virus from reaching a person. And this is why it's not enough to, during COVID, for example, it wasn't enough to just wear a mask or just do physical distancing or just wash your hands. And that's why also vaccines were never enough on their own and quarantine alone wasn't enough and ventilation wasn't enough. And some of these things are personal responsibilities at the individual level and others are systemic responsibilities that the government can do, that institutions can do. So the idea there is to prevent the virus from reaching the person. So what I did is I took this idea and changed it into an analogy for caring and equitable education. And basically, instead of the virus, I have all these causes of inequity and need for care. So diverse causes of that. So systemic things like racism, classism, heteropatriarchy, ableism, normativity, xenophobia. And these can be systemic or they can happen like in the on a microaggressive level for individuals. And of course, it's intersectional. And so if you think about who your learners are and who's the most marginalized of your learners, different learners will be marginalized in different ways. And some of them will have different uh, things they're coping with. So each of these, these are different viruses, not just one virus that you're trying to prevent, but different sized ones. So some of them will pass through the bigger, the smaller holes, the bigger holes, you know, and the room and cheese also has an additional <laughs> dimension to it, which is really useful for this analogy, which is sometimes one slice of it will have a black peppercorn on it. And black peppercorns are really, really spicy and sharp. And some people like them, but they make other people uncomfortable. And this is a reminder that if each of these layers was a strategy that we use in our teaching or in our educational systems that was supposed to stop the inequality from affecting our students' learning, that sometimes one layer of strategy that we do, like something like culturally relevant pedagogy, for example, as a strategy, 
might be helpful to some people, but be uncomfortable for others. And we need to think about the fact that promoting justice isn't one thing. There are so many layers and so many different things we need to do, but also that one thing that hurts one group may, may benefit another and vice versa. And so how do you make those decisions when you have a mixture of students from different backgrounds? Um, and so let's take another example of something. So something like the, the previous example about uh, culturally relevant pedagogy, it's most relevant to, if we had a layer of that, most relevant to things like xenophobia and racism, right? And now trauma-informed pedagogy is useful for other types of groups, right? And there are diverse causes of trauma and the need for care. So African Americans in the U.S. because of the mass shoot and not the mass shooting, sorry, the you know the shootings, they get shot in in certain ways. Asian Americans uh, during the pandemic just being uh, you know a lot of a lot of microaggressions that they faced at the time. Palestinians anywhere in the world, especially right now, uh, whether they live there or outside, are suffering a lot of trauma right now people with pre-existing mental health challenges, anyone with intergenerational trauma, right? So not just Palestinians, also Holocaust survivors and their and their offspring, right? So all of these are people who, who are suffering and need this trauma-informed pedagogy more than the regular person. Although of course, for the most part, any trauma-informed approach to teaching will probably benefit everyone, right? So if we were to think about this, I just wanna ask you who are your learners, who are the furthest from justice? Like what are minority groups or marginalized groups uh, that you deal with on a regular basis in your classes or in your institutions? Let me know in the chat. We are racialized folks. So that intersectionality, very important. Students with disabilities, for sure. And then different institutions are better at supporting some disabilities versus others, right? And you'll know which ones your institution has a lot of facilities for. So we have a lot of facilities for visually impaired, but we don't have a lot of good uh, facilities for the hearing impaired, for example, uh, learners who are hearing impaired. International students, a lot of times, yes, Annie, thank you. And, and within the international student pool, if they're from the UK, it's different than if they're from France, it's different than if, if they're from Nigeria, and it's different than if they're from China, right? Uh, Lassandra is saying all the above, English as second language learners in general, right? Because that that's automatically disadvantages them if it's an English speaking institution. Uh, First Nation, yes, First Nations and Métis with intergeneration firsthand trauma for sure. So in the Canadian context, for sure. And I guess Australian as well. Yeah. Women in low income jobs, right? Because they're juggling that as well as uh, college. And so their time is different than everybody else's time. Learners who are not tech savvy, particularly during COVID and now after COVID, I think everybody uses maybe more tech than usual. Refugees, for sure. So people without landed status in Canada, that makes sense. Thank you all for that. So I'm curious, like, what are some pedagogical strategies that you use to help learners who are marginalized in those ways? Before I show my, my roomy cheese. Or I can show my roomy cheese layers, but you can develop your own layers, right? Or whatever works for you. So I have things like culturally relevant pedagogy. I have universal design for learning, who someone uh, said they just published a chapter on. So <laughs> congratulations. Uh, there's the opportunity for self-mapped learning pathways that we can offer in our courses sometimes. There's intentionally equitable hospitality, which I will talk about soon if nobody has ever heard of it. There's just giving learners agency. There's trauma-informed pedagogy. There's generally building community helps create a more caring environment and And their institutional policies, like during COVID when we had pass fail, that helped. Uh, if the institution banned uh, remote proctoring and algorithmic proctoring, that would have helped. So what kind of things would work for your students? So UDL, CRP, COI. Is COI the community of inquiry? The Anderson, uh, Terry Anderson one? But definitely UDL and CRP. And he's saying games, examples, inductive or inductive teaching, depending on what I'm teaching and how students telling stories. Yeah, I like the telling stories one, especially because it allows for a different way to approach knowledge that is more accessible to more students, I think, than very formal ways of teaching. I'll keep going, but you guys keep them coming as well. All right. So I want to introduce the equity care matrix. And to me, uh, this is the thinking of me as Amora and myself, and we work together a lot. And we started this idea 
during the open ed conference in 2020, but we've been building on it since then. Um, oh, I like that one a lot, Anna. This very specific how you change your language prompts to instead of what you do in your country to what you do in a place that you've lived in before. And so that way, if someone can't name the country, doesn't want to reveal country, they can still um, answer that question. It's a really sensitive way to, to say it. So the, the equity care matrix came out of a Twitter question that I asked once, which is what is equity without care and what is care without equity? And we grouped the, the responses people gave and we actually wrote a paper out of it. And we, we ended up with these quadrants, right? So when there's equity, but no care, well, first of all, when there's no equity and no care, we're calling, we're calling this in systemic injustice, right? But when there is equity, but no care along with it, we're calling this contractual equity. So this is, a, for example, when you have a system in your institution that says that you have to comply with certain laws for learners with disability uh, and accommodations and so on, and the accommodation letters come. I don't know what the system is where you are, but where I am, we get an accommodation letter that tells us how to respond to a student's needs. But the individual instructor may not care about what they're getting. So they may check the boxes of doing what it is, but they're not doing it with actual care where they truly understand uh, what it says and they're really trying to, to promote that kind of equity. A lot of people will say, oh, but we're like coddling them or whatever. They don't understand that this is actually how to be equitable. That's actually how you give them an equal chance to succeed. So that kind of thing happens. Um, and then when you have care but no equity, then it's a situation of partial care. And partial care, hang on a second. All right, so partial care is partial in three ways. Partial that some people are doing it and some people are not doing it. And so you get burnt out, the effect of labor. It's partial that some people are receiving it and others are not. So it's kind of selective care because whoever gets noticed gets the care, but not everyone gets the care. And it's partial because it's partial. It's not impartial, it's biased. So, so usually that's what's gonna end up happening if it's not equitably distributed care. And so with if you wanna have both care and equity, we're calling it socially just care. And a lot of times we refer to it as, yes, affirmative action in the US would be contractual equity for sure. And now they removed it, I think, in a lot of places, which is because they didn't understand, I think, why it was there. clearly very problematic. But anyway, um, socially just care and sometimes we call it socially just distributed care because it assumes everybody has a responsibility to care and it makes sure that everybody receives care to make sure that nobody is without the care they need. But more importantly, there's a the person who's getting cared for has a choice of how they want to be cared for. And this is one of the things that's really uh, problematic is a lot of care can be patronizing or patriarchal where uh, some of you talked about having elderly parents and a lot of times when we care for our elderly parents we assume we know what they want and we do it for them and it may not be what they want a lot of time my mother-in-law for example does not like to have her hand held when she crosses the street even if she's not working very stable that upsets her um, a lot of times I think that my mom's going to like it if I go to her at a certain time of day and that's not the time of day she wants me to go for example so um, with children we do this all the time and as they get older we we give them more agency and we listen to them a lot more, but when they're very young, we don't, right? We assume, oh, you must be hungry. Oh, you must be sleepy, <laughs> you know? So it's important to think about uh, how do we, how might we be doing that in our context as educators? And how is that maybe um, suppressing students' ability to thrive? So can you think of any examples from your context of any of those quadrants? Someone already mentioned, you know, affirmative action being an example of contractual. Can you think of other things? Assuming that technology used is what's best for student learning. Yeah, so if there's an opportunity to give students the right to choose which technology they want to use, that's always a good idea. If, if there are several equally, equally good enough technologies not to necessarily force one on them. Um, someone saying sweaters are things children wear when their mothers are cold. <laughs> this part of here, that's a very funny one, but I think it's probably true. Yeah, the mothers are cold today, assume the kids are cold and people feel 
you know, cold or hot uh, differently. Hiring of specific demographic groups and then not doing anything to retain them exactly or care for them when they're here. That's contractual, right? That's like you bring them in and you say, yes, I brought them in. Now I have diversity, but you're not doing anything to help them succeed. So you're not really caring for them. So then the person who put that policy didn't do anything to change the culture. So that culture becomes welcoming to these new people for whom the system was not developed. Thank you, Ashley. That's great. Separate exam centers for students with disabilities. Is this a, a good thing or a problematic thing, Lynn? Are you seeing it as a good thing or a problem for me? Anna, grouping international students together, assuming that their needs are universal, that's a great one as well, right? You need to look at the individual needs. Assumption that all international students are not English language learners or are, whichever, definitely. So Lynn is saying separate exam center students with disabilities is problematic. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that from you as well, because students with disabilities have never told me that they have a problem with that. Um, so I'm curious. I know that sometimes they need extra time, and so the classroom wouldn't be free if that was given, or sometimes they need someone to speak to them out loud. If they have like a thing, so I assume that's why it's done, but I don't know why it would be public. Uh, Donna, registration assessing to determine eligibility for care. So yeah, having to go through that process in itself problematic. I think. Annie, giving students choice if they want to work individually as part of a team, having them to choose their team members, that's a good thing, right? Or is that a bad thing? Sometimes when they choose their team members, some people get left out. This is a very tricky thing, I think, in sports and in higher education and throughout education. And then in the real world, it's a completely different situation. I'm curious, Annie, what you want that to be. Not understanding trauma-informed education practices, for sure, Latana. It's not something a lot of us are trained on, right? Ashley, not requiring participation when discussing difficult topics. Um, and is that a good thing or a bad thing, Ashley? Uh, so Lynn is talking about exam centers as creating a sense of segregation. Yes, Ashley, so I agree. Yeah, not requiring participation when discussing difficult topics would be a form of socially just care. And you don't have to know every individual student as long as that's your rule. Then that's, that's one of the socially just care types of universal practices, right? Like when you think about universal design for learning, it's about giving choices uh, all, all the way through. And that, for the most part, covers a lot of different um, needs of marginalized groups and minorities and students with disabilities. And then there might be a few others that don't fit into whatever you design, but at least you start off with giving choice and having diff different pathways. Yeah, offering multiple means of participation, exactly. So you want to write or you want to talk out loud or Definitely, or you want to do it visually. All right, thank you all for that. So another model I want to share is compassionate learning design. I worked on this with two colleagues from South Africa, and it's built on uh, the work of Nanwe Hikahana from New Zealand, who is an indigenous Maori scholar. And it's it's an uh, and also there's someone from Canada who works on this, Caroline Eves or Ives, um, and she's been adapting it as well. So we're adapting it to doing participatory design in our teaching. And so the model goes like this in terms of learner agency and recognition, how we can increase that. If you start at the two, we do things to learners, meaning we decide what they want out of care. We still care and we give it to them. So like a baby, you give them milk, or you give them yogurt, you think that's what they need. The next level is to do something for them, but we take a little bit of their input in. So like with a baby, when you say, oh, do you want yogurt or apples? So they have a little bit of choice, but we've created what those choices are. The with is when you assume that the learners can themselves maybe take more uh, agency over what they're doing. So with a child, it's like they can come with you to the kitchen and they can cook their own meal and they can put the ingredients with you and decide which ingredients to use. Um, the buy is when they decide which ingredients to have in the first place and we're not you know, there with them, they're doing it by themselves, maybe multiple learners together. Um, and we're just there to supervise or whatever, but the, it's their choice to do it. We don't even have to sit with them while they do it. And we can give them even more agency if they do it as themselves. So with learning, that's when they, you know, with cooking, they go and buy the ingredients themselves and buy the tools and they decide how they're going to cook it. They're not even using the ingredients that are in, in our home. They're bringing their own ingredients, however they want to do them. Um, and in education, this is a really difficult ask the as part, which is the very top right. But but the with and the by, I think, are achievable. A lot of times you just stop at the with, but there's possibility to give learners even more agency, especially as they advance in their college education. 
and especially when they're older. Um, so the other thing that I want to show you guys is intentionally equitable hospitality. And what it is, is it's an assumption that every classroom or every course or every learning space is a space where someone who's the teacher, facilitator, whoever we are, have power and we have a responsibility to make that space hospitable and welcoming to diverse people. And for, for it to be equitable, we need to always keep renewing our intention because it's not gonna automatically be like that just because we say everyone's welcome. And so we need to pre-design before we even start designing. Can we involve previous learners in the design? Can we involve diverse other professors and teachers in the design? What are you reading? You know, What are you reading on a day-to-day -day basis and how diverse is your reading list? Um, who are the accreditors or quality assurance decision makers they have in positions? Might those in positions privilege certain people over others? And how can we dismantle or resist that? And then while we're resisting, can we anticipate certain inequalities? So if you know you'll always have some learners who are not English language learners, what are you going to do to help them with their reading and writing, for example? Can we redress certain oppressions in our courses? Might our course be reproducing some? What can we do about it? But then whatever you've designed, you come and you meet the learners, whether you're teaching online or face-to-face, -face, synchronously or asynchronously, there's some degree of facilitation a lot of time. And can you, when you discover an inequality that you hadn't anticipated, sometimes something new arises, right? We need to do intentional adaptation, what Adrienne Marie Brown calls intentional adaptation. And remember that even if we want to give agency to learners, there's still power dynamics between learners. And we need to use our generous authority Priya Parker calls it generous authority, to make sure that we use it in the in the service of justice, right? Whatever power we have, make sure that we use it to help those furthest from justice to speak up and be heard and get what they need. And then beyond the moment, we need to sustain community. And how do we sustain community inclusively and equitably amongst learners over time? And not only within one course, but also between courses that they're building up towards like a program, like a master's program or an undergraduate program, can we do that and how can that be used in order to improve equity overall? I'm gonna skip this slide because I'm almost running out of time, but there is an entire blog post about this, which I don't link to. Um, but it's important to think just generally that any equity work care is destined to fail if there's no ecosystem of care around it and think about what's missing in your ecosystem that would make equity and care more difficult for you if you wanted to practice. And what I wanna ask you now is, and we're running out of time, but I think we have time. I think I have about 10 minutes and we can do one of these things. We can either uh, talk about examples of community building resources and how do we apply equity and care to the way we do them. Or we can talk about artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence and how to respond to it while keeping equity and care in mind. And also you might be equally interested in both. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a Mentimeter Let's have you guys vote on this because Slido isn't working. This should work in a second. <laughs> I have to, I know, but um, just so Lynn can get some Q&A in if she wants. <laughs> All right, so I think the easiest thing is to copy the voting link and put it in the chat, I think, QR reader. Right? I'll put the QR code on. So the people who are answering faster, oh, now they're equal. <laughs> That's fun. Oh my God, I feel like the Muppet. I think this is a Sesame, Sesame Street character, isn't it? Is it the biscuit guy? Is his name? <laughs> Cookie Monster, yes, Terry, hi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did that happen? That's very funny. 
like the number of people who voted is changing, but it's going down rather than going up, which is very confusing for me. <laughs> and the difference between the two is so small. But also like we have 90 something people and only 20 something have voted. So it's not gonna be represented. I'm gonna assume people who aren't voting are flexible. Oh my gosh. Okay, this feels like, I feel like I'm in a tennis match and as soon as there's a two point difference, I'm gonna declare a winner. <laughs> But there isn't. They're just like neck and neck. What am I going to do? What do I do? A little bit of both? I think that's what you guys are saying. You want to do a little bit of both, huh? Let's do a little bit of both. I think this is this is what this is saying. I'll do a little bit of both. Okay. I'll do a couple of slides from community building, a couple of slides from the AI, and see how it goes. Ignore this. This wasn't working earlier or something. Okay. So I don't know if all of you are aware of the community building resources that we created at Equity Unbound. We created these um, at the like in August of 2020. Uh, it was for a lot of us in the Northern Hemisphere, the first time a lot of people would be teaching fully online ever in their lives versus the few of us who were experts in online learning. Everybody else had to do it. And I noticed that everyone in my institution and elsewhere around the world were like, oh, yeah, we know how to teach online now, but the building community thing, we're, we've lost that. Like we can have relationships with students, but they don't build community with each other. We're like, wait a minute, we know how to do this. This is doable. It's just that a lot of the research and publications on online learning beforehand, before the pandemic, was mostly about asynchronous learning for mostly adult learners who chose to be there because that was the best option for them for a lot of different reasons. Whereas now it was for everyone, every age, everywhere in the world that had internet. And so it needed to be done differently. And a lot of it was synchronous, which is not the way a lot of online learning used to be before. It wasn't the core of online learning. And so we created these resources. And the key thing about them is, first of all, the creation of these resources in and of itself is a socially just care act because there's a lot of institutions that don't have teaching and learning centers to help them with this. There are a lot of teaching and learning center employees like myself that were burning out because we're suddenly supporting an entire institution when we used to support like 10% of the institution that were interested in our help, but suddenly everyone needs the same thing and nobody knows much about it and you're having to, to figure this out your small team of however many they are. Um, and it then became a thing where, you know, anybody in the world could benefit from it, but, but it wouldn't be necessarily socially just care if we only told people how to use Zoom to do things. So every time there was a resource here, we would think about, okay, so the people who created it originally, myself, Mia Zamora and Autumn Keynes, Autumn and Mia are in the US, I'm here, but there's a lot of people who contributed from different parts of the world. And a lot of people were looking at it and giving us feedback. And so what we would create something and we'd say, here are some intentional adaptations. So, oh, if you have Zoom and you can use breakout rooms, you can do it this way. But if you don't have breakout rooms, here's another way you can do it. Oh, if you can meet your learners synchronously, here's how you can do it. If you can't meet synchronously, here's how you can do it asynchronously. Um, if your learners have their cameras on, you can do it this way. But if your learners don't want to turn their cameras on, here's another way to do it. So let me give a couple of examples of that. First of all, uh, pre-course surveys are ways to listen to students. I don't know if any of you do them, but it's a kind of a pre-designed thing. If you don't know who your learners are before you meet them, you can survey them the week before your classes start to understand their needs. So their needs and their interests. So I got to know, for example, early on that my students don't like to turn their cameras on during online meetings because of one, two, three, four. And sometimes it was uh, because they had bad bandwidth. Sometimes it made them anxious sometimes because of privacy reasons, but I knew that ahead of time. So I never asked them to turn their cameras on. Um, sometimes I get to know if they have their own private computer or if they're sharing it or whatever. With face-to-face, -face, I check their interests and, and whether they can bring a laptop to class or a phone so I can know how to design my activities, for example. Um, annotating the syllabus is an activity that, um, I'm gonna put links to these right now. Annotating the syllabus is an activity I learned from Remy Collier in the US um, and, the way he does it is he gives students early on 
in the semester or the syllabus to give comments on what they want and what they want to change. So this gives students opportunities to have a say in how your course is going and give you feedback pretty early on and help you clarify things you're not clear on. Then you can use it again in the middle of the semester to get their feedback. This is an activity where we talk about it. We talk, oh, you can do it using a Google Doc, but you can also do it offline and put then have them put sticky notes on the walls and you know giving offline options as well. And then there are ways to set the tone, like talking to students about trauma-informed pedagogy at times that are difficult, sending them a welcome video or a letter, especially if you're teaching online so they get to see you and get the tone of your class, introducing things like gratitude journaling to help students know that you care about their well-being, that kind of thing. And then the constant checking in is very important for me too, and to try it in different ways. Now let's talk about these two types of checking in. One of them is an emotion grid. And I use this one a lot for students who keep saying they're fine when I ask them how they're feeling. Um, because a lot of times that's what they're gonna say. So I tell them, here's a lot of range of feelings. They can feel more than one. Uh, now this helps people for whom, who aren't very verbal, like they won't be able to come up with terms like stunned or hyper or easygoing or apathetic, like right off the bat, but it just sort of helps them express themselves easier. Um, the one on the right, the blob tree, makes it more visual, right? The issue with the one on the right is that I had a student who was blind. And so in a normal context where you think everybody is sighted, you would just say, I feel like number 14 or I feel like number nine. And then you'd go on and explain. When we had this student in our, in our context, we would have to say, I feel like number eight who is reaching out in such and such way to, num to another person, you know, or I feel like number 10 who has their arm around another person. So this is just a reminder that even an activity that's meant to be caring could be excluding someone if you don't keep in mind who might be there. Um, and so you could train yourself generally to always describe images, for example, on your slides or something. But definitely when you know that there's someone in the room sending them slides ahead of time, creating alternative text, but in an activity like this, always reminding the other people in the room to describe the blob tree character, not just to say number 15 or number 12. That's an example of an adaptation. Um, there are, for example, these four activities. One of them is called story of your name, where you ask people to give a story of their name, like how they got their name or what it means or something. And while this is a fun activity and a lot of people love it, especially if you have a lot of diverse students, um, someone wrote for us some safety considerations to think like trans students may not want to reveal things like that. Sometimes people have had a change of name because they're in the witness protection program in the US. And so you, you need to give people alternative pathways through this activity, like letting them know ahead of time that you're going to do it so they can prepare their story. Because sometimes people just get shocked by this question. And another thing is to say, you can share the story of a family member or a friend or something in a movie. Yeah, it can be really sensitive, Joan. So for the most people, it won't be, but you need to take care of the 1% or 10, 2% that are gonna be sensitive. Another one is like a tour of where you are. Yeah, open your camera and show us your room. That is so problematic. And even when we were recording the video, one of us is like, there are other people here. I can't open my camera. Somebody's like, my house is not very well organized right now. I'm not going to open my camera. Someone else is like, oh, my bandwidth's not good today. So you have to have alternatives for things like that. Um, a third one is what kind of animal are you or would you be? And uh, the person who was telling the story was from Kenya. And she said that she was doing it with a group of, I think, South African men who got offended by the question and they refused to answer it. And then it turned out another South African gave us feedback that this is a very offensive post-apartheid South Africa question to ask. And so you have to have alternatives, like what kind of car, what kind of hat, what kind of something, uh, and not stick to the thing that you had planned. So always this intentional adaptation facilitation. Um, and the alternative CV we give as an example of a, instead of asking people to introduce themselves, um, in ways that are uh, spontaneous, which sometimes puts people on the spot. Alternative CV is one that you do asynchronously so that you remember, uh, you know what, you remember what your students said later, right? So I'm gonna move on from here into AI because we're running out of time and some people wanted that. So how might we build community equitably with care around working with AI? And if you guys have been doing things in your context, please um, share in the chat as we go. And also, like, what are some inequities you know of related to AI and AI use? Let's start with them. We'll do like three or four minutes of AI and then I'll stop for questions. And then sometimes the question is, go to the slides that you didn't show. 
<laughs> Terry, access to it in the first place. Yeah. You know, I couldn't. In Egypt, you don't have access to ChatGPT without VPN and somebody else's phone number. So a friend of mine in the US made me use help me use his phone number. It reflects the biases that already exist on the internet for sure. Having support to know how to use it appropriately, exactly. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of our learners don't, a lot of our teachers don't. <laughs> And a lot of people can't figure it out on their own very easily. They're intimidated. Thank you. The option to opt out of using because of how your identity may be tracked exactly by certain AI platforms. So the ways they work is they, they the potential of, of um, violating your privacy is pretty high. And we need to think about what Ben Williamson says here. It's like AI is not a neutral technology. No technology is really neutral. Uh, Alice is saying safe space to ask questions that you wouldn't feel comfortable asking in front of others or your instructor. That's that's true, actually. A lot of people do find that helpful. And for people who are generally just not vocal, right? They don't want to ask it out loud. A lot of developers, they are aren't representative of diverse communities that impact. Very true also. That's a very good one. So, but just to remember that AI is not a neutral technology, it's a political technology and it can be used to serve particular policy objectives and ideologies. And so, um, those of us who were uh, developed the compassionate uh, learning design model uh, have an idea for how to use that model in AI learning, right? I'm gonna just read what Anna wrote here. LLMs that AI platforms built on, voices have been prominent published with perspective that will be shared by AI, yes, for sure. And prominence in, in the sense of exists a lot of, not necessarily good quality, right? The way I guess Google works as well, the YouTube recommendations. All right, so how can we use care and compassion in the way that we respond to generative AI technologies in the way that we work with students on them? So Nicola Pallet, Daniela Gachago from South Africa and myself developed this. So let me just jump to that, right? So remember the two for with by as model? So in the two model, the educator decides which AI tool to use and how to question it and prompt it and shows the students and scaffolds the critical AI literacies through demonstrating it to students. And honestly, that's the thing I do at first because I don't know where they are on it yet. Maybe in future, most of them will be very familiar so it won't need to be done, but that's a, you decide what they need and you do it to them. But another option is to do something for them by asking them which tools they're familiar with and which ones they wanna use and maybe modeling for them the use and then giving them a, Opportunities to revise the question prompts, to decide what they want to do with it. And they scaffold it, but experientially, where the students themselves get to try things and not just what the instructor thinks needs to be done. But then if you do it with them, then the educator is maybe more openly discussing it and negotiating with students. And students can decide kind of what are the criteria for assessment and when is it appropriate to use AI in a certain assignment and when is it not appropriate to use AI. And then Another level would be to have it done by the students so that students become familiar with AI tools and then they decide, the students amongst themselves, not with the professor, they decide amongst themselves what criteria and what's appropriate to use AI for and whatnot. And then the professor just officially approves it and then that becomes what they use. And of course, as would be if they didn't even need the professor's <laughs> approval, which in higher education is hard, but in, in informal settings, it would be. Yeah, I mean, my entire slide deck is available. And so if Lutfia can, has it on hand, she can stay, share my slide deck. Um, and I'll, I'll share the slide deck again at the end. Um, yeah, I, it's a nice chart, isn't it? And it helps me think about what I'm doing in my class in the coming couple of weeks. And you can go from one to the other, right? As far as your students can go. Uh, but if they're already mature, you can start with the width right away. All right, so some community building that one can do around AI is sort of probing for attitudes and previous knowledge early on, introducing playful ways to learn about how it works. I usually use Quick Draw. I don't know if you guys know this game by, by Google, but it helps them understand how machine learning works a little bit. Promoting transparency, like tell me how you're using it, not you're allowed or not allowed to use it, but just let me know how you're using it and cite it. Um, and just helping students know about the inequalities and vices and potential harm. So it's not just about the, the equity is not in allowing people to use AI, but also helping them be critical of all the biases it can reproduce and the harm it can reproduce. Uh, and promoting this critical AI literacy, building guidelines together, which is what we did at my institution. The students participated in setting the student guidelines. Um, and addressing this mix of attitudes and feelings for both educators and students, honestly. 
And and thinking about the real world and that generative AI makes us think that, oh, everything that we do in writing doesn't make sense anymore. But learning isn't the writing. The learning is the stuff that we do and we write about it. So um, I think the more we do that, the easier it is to, uh, to do this. All right, I'm going to skip all of that because of time. The slides are available. Here they are. I'm going to put them in the chat again. And there is a French version that to be able to share. She shared, I think, the two language version. But this version is open for commenting because it's a Google slide, not a PDF. All right. So if you have a minute to share with me one thing that you're taking away from our conversation today in the chat, and I am open for questions in the Q&A or in the chat, whatever you like. Please share one takeaway. It makes a huge difference to me to know what you're taking away. Just keep this slide open for you. Thank you, Joan. Equity Care Matrix, Ashlyn, thank you. So that's been published as a paper and hopefully a book soon. So. Equity in AI with the framework you shared, and I'm glad you like that. Being mindful of everything you do in the learning space. Thanks. Egyptian cheese, all right. Come to Egypt so you can taste it. <laughs> the transference from health to education model. Yeah, I come from a medical family, so I got exposed to a lot of medical analogies. Um, general sense of optimism. Okay, Pat, I'm, I'm happy that you get that. I like that it's a feeling that you got. Equity framework, supporters of multiple check-ins. Thanks for demonstrating. Thanks, Elisa. There's so many others in the, uh, you know, in the website, so you can check it out. Like there, are, there's a whole section on check-ins, under warm-ups. The roomy, yay. Really value the equity care matrix and emotion grid. All right. Oh, I'm glad I put the emotion grid in. I just that's the first time I put it in a presentation. Actually, um, love the cheese analogy. All right, the blobs. Oh, oh my God, I'm so glad I put those in. I don't usually put them. Praying students for engagement, yeah, and the pre-surveys, equity and care, story of your name, equity care matrix, Rumi cheese, and east-west cultural bridge, yeah. <laughs> Arabic name. Specifics of tricky introductions, yeah. Sharing of resources, equity without care, care without, yeah, awesome. How to grow the world we want. Oh, I like it when someone remembers something from the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> That's so cool. All right, I'm going to stop sharing slides so I can. Oh, I'm not going to see you guys because this is a Zoom webinar. Too bad. But... Okay, I'm glad you're going to share some with colleagues. There's a lot of papers uh, for everything that was in there. Several uh, intentionally equitable hospitality and the equity care. And hopefully this recording also will be shared. All right. All right. Well. Thank you so much, Maha. I know we've got lots of great conversation going in the chat. We've got about three or four minutes left before we say thank you to you. Is there anything that anyone wanted to raise as a question? Thanks, Charlotte. I love listening to what you all brought in. And I learn when I give these sessions and I listen to what you guys have to say in the chat. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> just get lots, of, lots and lots of thanks, and I I got a millionth time. Is that Terry? Who's the millionth time? <laughs> yeah, it is Terry. Just thinking, who do I know? Who have I known the longest <laughs> from the people here? You can ask questions. It's okay. <laughs> Um, I have so many questions, Maha, but <laughs> I know our time our time is short. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a question. I see you uh, um, you're reaching out on LinkedIn, so I'll be happy to do that and carry on the conversation. Uh, I, I know um, people have to, to rush off probably for one o'clock meetings or whatever o'clock meetings it is uh, the time where they are. Uh, I just want to thank you. I know I, I've, I've learned a lot and uh, like many of the people um, I'm just coming away from this conversation with just a, a great sense of what's what's possible. I think. And it's all very, very doable and very human, which I think we need these days. So I want to thank you so much and thank everyone who took the time to join for this webinar. It's great to have everybody's engagement.